Sunshine, Bailey Avenue Ballpark, Gordy Little, and Kelvin Castine. How are you, Kelvin? Uh, I'm facing the sun right now. <laughs> but squinting, I'm fine. that's what you're doing, <laughs> squinting. And the camera's on a tripod, so I, I take no responsibility for what happens for, with the camera. For anything that we, sh we can't swing the camera around, show squirrels running under the trees or anything. You're going to see these two squirrels <laughs> for the next hour, hour and a half for a very good reason. And I might say that it's kind of rare to have Kelvin on camera on our little corner and it's a real pleasure because people comment what does Kelvin look like what's Kelvin really like he's a six, he's a six foot rabbit <laughs> I'm not sure what he has after I look at this book of history that you've done with your pictures and pseudonyms inside but that's the reason for our being here at the Bailey Avenue <laughs> Recreation Park on a beautiful sunshiny day in September 2002 we should point out though Gordy that I'm looking over at that Melissa L Penfield sign and although we've always known this as Bailey, Bailey Avenue, Avenue Park, it's Melissa Penfield and a great tribute to a wonderful lady, tremendous public servant, uh, and it's that's a beautiful sign that we probably should have taken a picture of it <laughs> on the way in this morning. But that's where we are, and I might say that this this area is a far cry from what it was when I first visited here in the 1950s. Many of our viewers are familiar with the fact that the Bailey Avenue uh, was the home of the Clinton County Fair for a long time. <clears throat> and it's changed a great deal. The big old green bleachers are gone, yeah. and now it's a, it is the Melissa Penfield Recreation Park, and it's quite beautiful for neighborhood kids. And so, our reason for being here is history. As our viewers might be aware, we spend a lot of time promoting North Country history. The towns and villages and uh, municipalities in our county and in other North Country counties are keen on history these days and it's a good thing. Why all of a sudden are we celebrating the history of Champlain? Well, uh, I don't know if it's all of a sudden, it's probably well, finally. Uh, <laughs> finally is the better word, yeah. <laughs> and this book uh, should not be in any way confused with the book that David Patrick has put out, that $500 uh, <laughs> book. <laughs> and 500 is, pound book, yeah. <laughs> which is really a compilation of of a portion of all this stuff that his ancestors and McClellan's accumulated over the years and it's really a genealogy his book is a genealogy and a accumulation of all the materials every letter is printed as it was written and uh, so this is this here is a, a different type of book and uh, it started out and it remains as a fundraiser for the proposed Bob Van Park which is on property next to Dewey Tavern in, uh, in Champlain which is uh, diagonal to the uh, Northeastern Clinton Central School District and lies between the villages of Champlain and Rouse's Point. And we were looking for ways to uh, raise funds uh, and back in 1999. And I remembered back to a book that uh, my parish had put out, I believe in 81. Oh, and, wow, 20 uh, years ago. Yep, and uh, what the situation was there, it was a small little booklet, and this was, when you look at the book we ended up with, and look at the, the concept of what we started out with, you see that we actually ended up coming a long way, but in here, all the families that wanted to take part went and got their picture taken, and for the price of getting that picture taken, you uh, got your picture in the book, and you got a, a picture to, to hang on your wall at home. So in here are a good number of the families of the parish of St. Mary's back at that era. And I just thought in 1999 with the new millennium approaching, Y2K, that we don't hear that word anymore, that's no. <laughs> phrase anymore, but Y2K was a, a big part of our vocabulary back then. Why not have a book that celebrated the town of Champlain and his residents in the year 2000? And uh, we, had, you and I had just finished uh, stories with uh, Hemingford and the, their histories and stuff so it kind of uh, you know spurred me on to this this type of a of an event so we had articles in the uh, in the press republican in the islander in the north countryman uh, had great press coverage I took flyers to uh, several of the area churches they were very cooperative to uh, leave them there for people to pick up it passed out it be passed out in the churches and uh, our response was tepid <laughs> here we uh, thought the floodgates would open word. up 
<laughs> but it was uh, kind of tepid. But the enthusiasm from those who did respond was, was overwhelming and gave us the impetus to say we're going to go on with this project. And you'll see some of the early families that responded uh, in this book. And as it evolved, the idea occurred to me that uh, you didn't want to just take a, a picture of the family as it is now, but maybe somebody, you know, you've got a lot of uh, people whose adult children have moved away from the area. So maybe they'd want to include those children. Maybe they'd want to include their own parents or grandparents or whatever. So we came up with the idea that uh, people would buy a, a family page if they wanted. See, uh, in order to have your picture in this book, submit your picture and pay five dollars. If you wanted to buy a book, that was that was fine. <laughs> well, hopefully, you <laughs> yeah. wanted to buy a book. So uh, you would submit your picture, and we were figuring at the time maybe twelve pictures. Uh, per page, so we'd make sixty dollars on that page, business ads, and then we went with the idea of the family page, where for seventy-five dollars you'd get a, a book for free, and you could do whatever you wanted within moral guidelines. <laughs> within reason, yeah. With that family page, so the response really, the majority of the people who responded wanted the family pages, and a lot of the people I think were overwhelmed with the idea. Of now it becomes work to come up with a family page. So I think that scared a lot of people away. But uh, the book evolved, and as we saw that there was going to be fewer families involved than we'd hoped for, well, then <laughs> the burden becomes to make the book worthwhile. So I said, well, maybe we'll come up with some history. So I said, I can easily get, you know, do an article on Dewey Tavern and on Fort Montgomery and maybe on each of the little hamlets of Cooperville and, uh, and Perry's Mills. So we decided to put some history in there. So the, one of the first places I went to was a lady named Addie Shields. I don't know if you've ever met Addie Shields. Oh, anybody <laughs> who's ever met Addie Shields never forgets the experience. What a wonderful lady. So you went to Addie and you- I went you, to Addie and she said, came out of the room three <laughs> weeks later. Three weeks later. Addy is our Clinton County historian. She sure is. And and uh, it's not just a, a job for her, it's a way of life for Addy. Oh, sure. And she comes out of there, you got to have this, you got to have that, got to have this, got to have that in this book. Well, uh, she uh, wanted me to include everything that she'd ever dreamed of in a book. <laughs> it just wasn't possible and it wasn't within the scope. That would have been way heavier than the <laughs> other book. <laughs> but uh, she did point me in a direction of... Uh, the geography and history of Clinton County. The, this is this called the second edition because I guess this first edition wasn't uh, that in, intensive. By H. K. Averill Jr., published in 1885. And she also got me in uh, in tune with a book called the 1860 Gazetteer of New York State. Yes. And that's a big, thick book and tremendous amount of information in there about not only Clinton County. But the entire state and how somebody in 1860 was able to gather all that, just uh, mind-boggling. You know, these days our resources are infinitely better than in those days, and you do have to pay great tribute to those people who did the research back then because it was all legwork. Uh -huh. Not that you didn't do some legwork oh. for this book, my <laughs> friend. It became a much bigger task. Uh, you and I, and before that, Bob, Ben and I, uh, I've interviewed uh, dozens of people who have put out books, and uh, I think the, the thing we hear so often is it became a bigger task than they had envisioned, and uh, somehow I didn't learn from <laughs> hearing all those people say that, and this became a much bigger task than I'd envisioned. Well, you know, but part of it has to do with uh, the passion of getting into the project and wanting to include more and more different kinds of things, because you, in spite of the fact that this was really a lot of hard work for you, it was it was really exciting, wasn't it, and fun in many many of its aspects. Yeah, it was because uh, you'd get into something and you'd say, "Well, we got to include this," or "This is just nice to know, but it's not a need to know as far as this book yeah. goes." And and because you can't include everything, because then you'd have that five hundred yeah. dollar book. So uh, we wanted to make it workable, and we wanted to make it so that. Um, it's a book that uh, goofy people like I can sit down and enjoy. 
I just find it overwhelming to sit down with a big thick book and read 20 pages tonight and 20 pages tomorrow. Uh, our articles in here are for the mice, moan, uh, excuse me, main part, one or two page articles. There's over 700 pictures in this book. Are there really? I counted between pictures, oh, photographs, goodness. maps, and things like that. Over 750 different uh, pictures and maps and drawings and uh, reproductions of uh, different things. And that includes uh, uh, some of the advertisers. So it's a book you can sit down with, spend five minutes, and, and uh, feel fulfilled after those five minutes because you're not in the middle of something. You can read a page or two or three or whatever. And you can pick it up later and read uh, again. And I also wanted the, uh, the idea that when you turn the page, you wouldn't know what to expect. Maybe it'd be a page of ads or maybe it'd be a, a, a short story, maybe it'd be a family. So when you turn the page, you're not quite sure what you're going to find on the next page. And I <laughs> thought that idea of anticipation and surprise would, would also be nice. <laughs> so, so you started on it how how many years ago 99 well didn't really get into working on this in earnest until within the last year <coughs> gathering material since since 99 uh, thinking all oh, this ought to be included that ought to be included not really sitting down and putting it on my computer until probably about a year ago and uh, we just knew that hey it's uh we've gone beyond the year 2000 we're now at that point approaching 2002 either we're going to do this or we're not and we've got people that have committed themselves to this book we've got to uh to go ahead and and, and do this so it was the uh, the early response from people that i think that spurred us on to uh to finish this uh, <laughs> and it seemed like it would never get done no and without i one with uh, hopefully i'll mention their names many times but without Jim Rochester at, at the Border Press, who, who adopted this, as I say in my uh, introduction in the book, who adopted this as if it was his own idea, this would not have happened. You know, we, we paid him to print it and so on, but if we actually had to pay for the hours that they put in, we, we couldn't have afforded to, to print the book because it, nobody could have afforded to isn't buy it. Isn't that the way it is with most projects like this? Most individual local <laughs> Everybody wants to read the book, but fewer than necessary people want to get involved in actually doing the work. If you had to be paid a dollar an hour for every hour you spent working on this book or thinking about this book, you'd probably be a multimillionaire. Well, I don't know if there's a million hours, <laughs> but a lot of, more than a dollar an hour. But but a lot of time. Yeah, a um, lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy. And you've made some history in producing this book, and I'm sure it'll be a thrill for people to read. Did you have a master? You said you didn't quite have a master plan in the beginning. You didn't anticipate it would be this no, big. No, this, this was the original uh, master uh, plan right here. Just that, that, that one this. picture book. And then as we talked, um, people in the committee, and I talked to people in the, that were going to put pictures in there, then the idea of the family page evolved, and... Uh, and then uh, as we started to gather history, that got more intensive. As I read through the uh, H.K. Averill work and the uh, 1860 Gazetteer, uh, if I had to make one change right now, because we ended up with 228 pages, and originally we were hoping to get 100, I would probably have combined uh, part of the Gazetteer and part of the Averill into uh, one section, but instead we've got extensive amounts of both but that was one of the first major projects that we did and uh, uh, editing that down would have been, a, been a, would, have, would have been a big chore what I did was I went through the gazetteer and this is one I had bought I've bought on eBay uh -huh. since then uh, in fact Addie's copy was missing several pages and is missing several pages so I mentioned that to our county clerk John Zerlo and uh, he had a more complete book so he gave me some pages that were missing but I found this one here on eBay and I think it's 
uh, better than either the county clerk or the county historian has. And it's complete. It's complete, yes. And where did, I, if I might ask, where did it come from? Who Was it out west? You don't have to mention uh, the, the name. Buff, but in the Buffalo area. In just, the Buffalo area. Uh, just, uh, it's amazing where these things go. Well, what surprised me the most was that I was able to afford it because I don't have a <coughs> excuse me a large budget for something like this here and I see some things that are sold on there and I can't believe the, the prices that people pay but I think just the way it was described didn't send up a lot of flags and uh, I don't think people realized what it was so I ended up being able to purchase this uh, with a, well, maybe about five six weeks ago I ended up buying this this is the second edition so there was a there was a first a edition but it was a smaller Oh, it was. Yeah, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't anything like this. But what a beautiful thing to own, isn't it? It, it is, and it's just so much history, and of the uh, geography. Uh, we'll get into it when we get into the book. But just a fantastic uh, a piece of history right here. And because it was printed in 1885, and because the other one was printed in 1860, I checked last fall with uh, a guy named Rich Cantwell. Uh, and uh, it was a lawyer you may have heard of, yes. currently our district Cur attorney. District attorney in Clinton County. <laughs> and he said, no, the, the, uh, the uh, copyrights uh, would have long been gone on these things, so we could quote these extensively. So what I did was, uh, when Clinton County was formed in March of 1788, uh, there was uh, the town of Champlain, town of Plattsburgh, town of Willsboro. Crown Point was included at that point also. So, uh, the towns that remain now in Clinton County that were once part of Champlain are Clinton, which we call Cherubusco, uh, really the town of Clinton, Ellenburg, Altona, Moores, Chazy, and the town of Champlain. So I've included their history from the Gazetteer and the uh, Averill book in here also. So people from those communities can also find their early history in here because it in the early history up until their town was taken off and the first towns were taken off in 1804, Moores and Chazy, up until then they were part of uh, the town of Champlain. Things have changed a great deal. We've learned that, haven't we, in some of the programs we've done from uh, Chattagay <laughs> down to Franklin County and Malone and Messina. Things do change over the years. This kind of book is of interest not only to the people who live in those towns, but I think of general interest because more and more people walk up to me and say, I liked your program with so-and-so. I never knew that about Shay-Z before. I never knew that about Champlain before. So anybody who's interested in history, from young kids to uh, people advancing in age will get a kick out of this book because there are a lot of great pictures. How many? So over 700. 700 pictures. And then this history that you talked about. I think we ought to pause for a moment to talk about Bob Venn and the reason you're you're trying to raise money with this book and uh, with the Bob Venn Park. Some of our viewers may be watching this program for the first time. Hopefully, people watch it every time. But Bob Venn was a pretty super guy, and his picture in this book, with that smiling face right near the front, does justice to who the man was. A really decent character and a and a bosom buddy of yours for so many years. But just talk a little bit about Bob Venn and why we're having a, why you want to put that park together. Well, uh, Bob had uh, probably from my early 20s had, you know, even though he was 19 years older than me, had become a person that I really got along great with, I, you know, uh, good friends with. And uh, over the years, I worked with him at the St. Mary's Bazaar and on a lot of other things, sports things and so on. And in uh, 83, when I first started uh, doing local programming with the camcorders and so on, and Bob was into that kind of stuff, so he, you know, I was always conferring with him off screen about, uh, he was in the Commodore computer, so I'd use my Commodore computer for graphics and so on. So it was always a uh, a part of Bob involved with what we were doing and uh, he retired I think in uh, probably about 88 <coughs> I had formed uh, Hometown Cable in 1986 and in 88 he retired and uh, 89 I imposed on him to do a couple of, of shows when the first one we did was the Ridgeview Farm when they were rebuilding 
And uh, finally in 1990, uh, I talked Bob into doing this weekly show that I'd, I'd had conception of right from before uh, we got the ability to, to do the programming. When, I, when the local cable came in, I read that there was going to be an access channel and I was available for public use. So I thought it would be a great way to cover some local sports, but also go behind the scenes and look at things that people don't necessarily get a chance to look at. Because uh, back in uh, 75 and 76 when I worked for the North Countryman, I'd done a, a few articles along that vein and I had to stop doing them because I was going to places that people don't necessarily get to look at and some of the advertisers were saying, well, why don't you do a story on me instead of this guy here who doesn't advertise with you. And so, <laughs> so I had to stop doing that for the North Countryman, but the concept remained. And uh, so in 1990, I finally convinced Bob, because he wasn't going to make a dime out of it, to, to try for a weekly hour-long program and uh, kind of the rest is history. We did what's going on here until 1997. We did it up to 24 hours before he, he died of a heart attack. And 24 hours before his death, Bob and I were out, out taping. The last show you did was at the Clinton County Fair? Yep, and that morning we'd done a show with uh, George Wydell and the, uh, the blacksmith who we saw on a parade a week ago as we are taping this. Yes. Uh, and then in the afternoon, we always did a program with Bill LePage at the Clinton County Fair. We did that, and we shut the camera off about 3.30 or so, or 3.15, 3.30. That time, the next day, uh, Bob had died. And you look at the tapes, and you would not know that this, uh, this man was that gravely ill. It makes us, but, all, so he makes enjoyed, us all realize how precious life is, doesn't it? And he enjoyed the, the program, and people who otherwise wouldn't have got to know the man got to know him through the What's Going On Here show. <laughs> and uh, became, particularly in the northern tier, uh, you know, a, a real celebrity that people really admired. And uh, when he died, uh, Jay Montpelier went to uh, Norm Bono, a teacher, and said, you know, one of the things I've always heard Bob say in his program was there's no park here in Champlain. And uh, I think it'd be a nice idea if we... Uh, we had a park, so they approached me to do a story on it, so I did a story on it, and interest in that grew, and uh, somehow I, they decided I should be on the committee. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> Although I hoped to be covering the committee and not uh, part of it. So uh, we're always looking for ways to raise money to, to make this happen, and of course, in the last year as we're taping this, uh, the possibility of getting grants has really diminished greatly because so much of our funds have now gone to, to other things since uh, the 9-11 disaster. <coughs> so uh, the idea was to put up a park, a family park, where the families can go and picnic and maybe play a ball, have a ball game or whatever uh, for the people in Champlain. So that's where the Bob Ben Park came about. And my concept, our concept, not my concept, but our concept of that uh, park is that you would have, well, just like here in ba at the former Bailey Avenue Park, you've got the Lefty Wilson Field. And I don't know if the football field has a, has a name dedicated to anybody, but you could have a, a John Doe ball field or a or sure. Jane Doe uh, picnic area, whatever, within the Bob Ben Park. Hoping that uh, maybe people will make donations in the memory of their families and so on, and, and the, the park could evolve into something that is uh, well, maybe as nice as maybe not as nice as what Plattsburgh has, but something that uh, well, it we certainly is a of. beautiful location. <coughs> the historic. location you've you historic. picked is beautiful and historic. Historic. That's that's the thing that first drew me to it when I knew that it was become available. Our members were looking at it, and it's right next door to the Dewey Tavern. And we'll, get, we'll probably get into the Dewey Tavern there, but from uh, August 28th up until that first week in September, 14,000 British troops, uh, Voltigeur from, uh, from uh, Canada, Indians, were camped all through that area, including where the Bob Ben Park is. <coughs> so the last time the United States was invaded, 
by ground forces. That's where it occurred. And the Dewey Tavern is uh, one of the most historic buildings in Clinton County. You and I both love it. We've spent yeah. a lot of time standing around it, walking around it. And the last time I was at the proposed site for the Bob Van Park doing a program, somebody, I forgot who it was, walked up to me after and said, look what I found in a ditch out in front of the Dewey Tavern. What's the guy's name that's in the tavern? Oh, Louis Bedard. Louis walked up and said, look, and he showed me a penny that was dated right around the, the War of 1812, Battle of Plattsburgh era. So he just picked up in the ditch. Well, well, said, actually, he, when he, was, he, dig, he was digging uh, a water trench or something. And he, and, he, and he found it. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? It is a beautiful area. And <coughs> this, well, this book isn't going to be totally enough to build, to, to build that beautiful park. So it'll take a lot oh, of effort okay. on, a, on behalf of a lot of people. That's a start. So, it's a great start. Yeah, so that's... So that's the story yeah, we'll of, of why we're doing this book and why you finished it. And Calvin will be showing you pictures as we look through yeah. this book. And I want to start with the cover today. because this cover was conceived entirely by Jim Rochester. Was it? And his, his daughter Elaine uh, uh, Cloutier works there with him and she did a lot. But uh, Jim was really the, the bulk and uh, uh, he showed me this cover. At, at, at first we, he talked about doing a montage of different photos and stuff. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So, when he told me just the uh, the fort, I wasn't quite sure. Then the more I thought about it, I said, "Yeah, that that's ideal because there's no building better known in the town of Champlain than Fort Montgomery, and it shows the lake and it shows history. So what you know, what else? The past and the present with a sailboat in front of it. Yep. An so, ideal photograph. I yeah. was I had no idea what you had on the cover of that yeah, book. Dave Since Pazic, I haven't seen it till today. Yeah, Dave Pazic uh, took that photo for for uh, Border Press Calendar, I think, a couple of years ago. Did he ago. really? Yeah. And what we should tell our viewers <laughs> is that when when we're sitting here in, in September, late September 2002, we say the town of Champlain 2000 is hot off the presses. We aren't kidding. It's still warm. <laughs> yeah, well, what we have here is a uh, uh, hastily put together book because border press did all the printing it's 228 pages so the, the pages are in fours sure so they had all these there's a, a thousand printing a thousand books right now <coughs> so they have a little over a thousand sheets so they had to fold all those and collate them and now they've done that and they have brought them down to glens falls for the actual binding so that is taking place as we are taping this so yeah, it's hot off the press. This, if I, uh, there might be one other. I'm not sure. I told them to do the same thing. Keep one for themselves, just for their own sake, in case people wandered in. But this might be the only one or two in existence right now that we're looking at. Well, that's kind of cool. It's something they kind of hastily glued together. So the, what they've done here is not going to hold up in the long run. But uh, the, when the finished product comes out of Glens Falls, it's, it will. It certainly looks like a finished product to me. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, it is, but except that the binding is a little weak because uh, it's uh, not uh, that many pages in something that they could necessarily do there. Uh, as we get in there, I want to take that blue sheet just for a moment. And one of the things that I know is going to happen is there are people in Champlain, Rouses Point, they're going to say, well, gee, I wish I'd known about that book. <laughs> always, isn't that always the way? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You didn't tell well, me you're going to be on my street. Yeah. So we had. I had it on hometown cable. It was in the Press Republican a couple times, thanks to Shan Moore and the Islander, thanks to Mary Rasco. Uh, Louise Spring did several articles in the North Countryman for us. Uh, the Christian radio station, uh, WCHP, did a 20-minute interview that was on. So it was on the radio. In addition, the phone company sent out this flyer in all their telephone bills. Oh, they did? Oh, I didn't even know that. That's me. So a year ago, at a soccer game, I asked this person whose uh, grandson's on the Northeastern uh, soccer team, I said, how come your family's not in that book? It's, you know, it's a prominent family. He said, what book? <laughs> I said, well, it was in your phone bill, if nothing else. I don't get the phone bill. My wife looks at that. So there's going to be people out there who's, who are going to say, gee, I wish I'd known about that book. Well. It was in the, started off in their churches with flyers, and it went to the phone bills, 
and it was in all the news media, so I don't know how else we're going to reach these people. You know, as they say in the service, there's always a <coughs> certain percentage of people who just don't get the word. Yeah. And you and I are, are, you know, I guess we could use the phrase media freaks. We're interested in what's going on in our world. We're interested in what's happened in our world yesterday and what's happening today. It helps us, it helps us feel a part of, of our North Country. Some people don't, and that's their choice, but it's, uh, it's so nice when you can pay attention to what's on television, especially on the public access channels here throughout the North Country, because you get an overview of uh, historical things, and we hope this program gives some, our viewers something they couldn't get anywhere else. And that's one of our great goals, to bring, bring history to life. And I, I must congratulate you, Calvin, for doing that in this book. Shall we go through it a little book, a little bit? And page by page, we're going to go through this. <laughs> and we're going to start with the inside front cover. And another, another one of the things that I feared, <coughs> because the time lapsed between when we conceived this and when it finally came out, that there, I would find in some crevice <laughs> something that should have been included in the book. All, always happens. And about two weeks ago, I was putting away, I think I was putting away this Averill book in my bookcase, and I find this sheet that Marshall Maynard had sent me, way back, with his family, this, these pictures right here. So I got on the phone I, to Jim Rochester, I said, Jim, I don't recall seeing the Maynard family in there. Is it in there? No, no. <coughs> I said, oh boy. So I called uh, Moose, as, we, as he's known, Marshall Maynard. I said, how did we stand? I said, I know you were one of the first to respond when we talked about this. But I said, I don't recall that you ever... He says, no, he says, it's my fault. He says, I didn't follow through. He says, I kept meaning to. I sent you that page that my son had conceived. <coughs> I said, but you know, it's, if it's too late, it's too late. I said, well, on the inside front cover, we've got a drawing that Samuel D. Champlain had made, and I've seen it reproduced several times, so it's not something that people can't find if they really look for it, of his battle with the Iroquois back in 1609. I said, we'll, uh, I'll see if Jim has printed the cover yet. So I called Jim back, and he hadn't printed the cover. That was the only thing he hadn't printed. All the Isn't pages were printed. that amazing? I said, is it possible to do this? And I've said that 500 times in the last year. And every time, whatever you want, whatever you want. Jim Rochester, as I said, couldn't have been more cooperative. I'm sure inside he was saying, oh boy, what is... But, so, people are going to pick up this book. 20 years from now and so on, look at the Maynard family and say, wow, that must have been quite a family. <laughs> They're right there on the inside cover. And that's how they got there. <laughs> yeah, it would have been easy, you know, to say, oh, too late, Marshall, your family's not going in there. But I, it's not, you know, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, people like the Maynards who said, hey, this is a great idea, are the people that help spur us on. So I want to make sure to include this. And the, the pictures here don't, don't include Marshall's generation, I'm sure. <coughs> I'm a little too much asthma today. If we'd gone, uh, if he'd followed through, there would have been a, another page showing his generation and his children. But So anyway, we ended up going back to 1841 here. This, this, these people born in 1841. So that's a good way to start the book. From Quebec and across, you know, from England to Quebec and from Quebec yeah. to, to the and, Champlain area. And you talk about learning things. Last night I was re reading through this and I see Alan Maynard. And that's Marshall's father. Now, I've known Marshall for 35 years and I knew Alan Maynard when I worked at Sheridan in 1966 and so on. Never put them together. Alan Bunny Maynard was his nickname and I sure enough it says electrical department at Sheridan. And I never knew that Bunny Maynard was Moose Maynard's father. But you know, now, now I know. And I should have known, but I didn't. So yeah, and uh, the, next, the first page is an in, is the forward, and we mentioned the uh, the committee members: uh, Jay Montpelier, Norm Bono, Jules Trahan, Mary Rasco, and uh, Reverend George Long was a member when we first conceived the book. 
And on there, I thank uh, Addie and John Zerlo and Jim Rochester, the Champlain Telephone Company, who had been with us right from the start. In fact, a year ago at their open house, the Bob Venn Park was the fundraiser. They had displays there for people that wanted to, to get their pictures in the book. Another chance for people to be aware of it. They sent as part again in their phone book. As part of their thing, they mentioned it again in their, in their, their billing system. Uh, Pauline Brandi Brandisi, uh, we needed somebody to go out and to contact the businesses to see if they'd want to help support the book by taking an ad. Pauline stepped forward and did a tremendous job, tremendous job. And you know, a great deal of the success of this book is, is due to her efforts because uh, with the people that, uh, that uh, paid to have their family pages in there in the advertising, most of the printing costs was already paid for. So people without her, that, that wouldn't have been possible. Then uh, I mentioned again uh, Mary Rassico, who, uh, what I did, as I mentioned earlier, I went through the, the uh, April and the Gazetteer and highlighted what I wanted typed up. Now, if I was typing that, this book wouldn't have been out this, <laughs> this century. So Mary Rassico said, I can do that. And she sat there, and some of that printing so is tiny. so tiny. <coughs> so she would type it all up. I, she'd give me back the pages. I would take those pages and compare them with the original. And naturally, there's going to be a few differences here and there. So I'd highlight those, give them back to her, and uh, she'd type it up again. So I can't imagine the hours that she spent and the hours that she, you know I would have spent would have been beyond belief. So she did lots she and meant, lots of typing uh, lots for of, you, right? Yeah. The, and wonderful. there and later on, there's another portion that she did a lot of work on. <coughs> so that's the forward. That's beautiful. Yeah, and the next page is just a picture of the monument at St. Mary's and the and an introduction to the uh, to the gazetteer. So I, I tried to highlight uh, yeah, this uh, right right to start at the Gazetteer. It points out that uh, you know March seventh, seventeen eighty eight, uh, Clinton County was formed. That's when the town of Champlain was formed. It was named after George Clinton, uh, governor. Uh, Essex County was taken off according to this in seventeen ninety nine. Saint Lawrence was provisionally annexed in eighteen o one and taken off in eighteen o two, and Franklin County was taken off in eighteen o eight. And uh, these are things that seem to have been lost to a, a lot of people. When we did the story in the Chattagay, there was little, I don't think there was anything uh, pointed out that Chattagay was once part of Champlain. They just start with the birth of Chattagay without saying that originally it was part of the town of Champlain. When we did the story up in Messina this year, uh, they didn't seem to know about Palatine and the Katnawaga. So since then, I have sent down maps that we got from uh, Wayne Miller yes. at the Feinberg Special Collections that show the original town of Palatine, which went just beyond, just west of Clinton County <coughs> and ran north-south. And next to that was Katnawaga, which ran north-south. North and uh, Messina seems to have been right on the borderline of those two. But people in Messina don't seem to be aware of that. So uh, I've, now Teresa Sharp, thanks to that map, is now looking into that. And uh, you know, the history of Messina will be expanded to include uh, its early history. Well, it's, it's very nice, and it's important to know the facts. Because when you perpetuate history with incorrect information, then you're creating a disservice, I think, to our forefathers. So well, not necessarily incorrect, incomplete. Incomplete is yeah. a more accurate term, yeah. yeah. But sometimes when people write history, they <laughs> are perpetuating facts that they've read somewhere, which oh. may or may not be precise. Well, there's a couple of mistakes right here in the Gazetteer that uh, I think I may have highlighted here. But So it's uh, at the point in time there were four weekly papers in the Clinton County. Uh, it mentions a bunch of defunct ones, but the four that are still were still around time were the Plattsburgh Republican, Plattsburgh mm -hmm. Express, 
Rouse's Point Advertiser. I'm getting a glare, so you're going to have to. <laughs> and the Plattsburgh Center. Center. <coughs> yeah. So those were the, uh, the papers that were around at the time, but a bunch of others I mentioned in there and uh, came and went in between. Now, here's one of the mistakes that I, I spotted, and I put an editor's note into it. It says an important naval engagement took place September 11th, 1776. Uh, in, in the strait between Valcor and the west shore between the British and American forces. Well, somehow, and again, this book is this thick, and this guy is compiling all this information, this H.K. French. So he got September 11th confused with October 11th, and uh, that was a mistake. But uh, he does get into a chronology later on in this this history that we included on the events of the war, uh, the battles that took place, the troop movements in 1812, 1813, and 1814. As you can see, there's quite a bit of, quite a bit of different uh, events that took place over that three-year period in our in our county. You you wrote all, you you're <laughs> responsible for writing all the history in here. No. Did you get any help with that? No, no, no. What I what I did here, this is all quoted from the Gazetteer. From the Gazetteer, sure. Right. So this this is a so this early portion is the Gazetteer. The next portion will be the uh, the April book, and then we get into all the little historical sketches. But even the ads, uh, here's an ad from the uh, the Bob Gooley family. <laughs> Mentioning the in a picture of the Tasty Freeze, which opened in 1960. Oh yeah! I mean that's part of our our cultural history. It certainly and is. It's great to have that included in there. Oh, that's wonderful. <coughs> so you have a long portion from the Gazetteer. Yes. Quite a quite a bit. And as I mentioned, we we included uh, each of the towns in Clinton County. I didn't go into Essex and into Franklin County, even though. Mo uh, most of northern Franklin County was part of the town of Champlain in yes. 1788. I only included the the Clinton County town. So there's a, a paragraph here on Altona, which was formed from Chazy on December 2nd, 1857. It mentions Champlain being formed in 1788. Chateauguay was taken off in 1799. Moores and Chazy in 1804. So coming up very shortly, Moores and Shazy will both have their 200th anniversaries. Yeah. Next year, as we know, we're going to Moira for their oh yes 200th anniversary. And this year, of course, we did Messina and Malone's 200th anniversaries. Uh, Perry's Mills was named from uh, uh, George Perry. Coopersville was named from Ebenezer Cooper, who erected mills there on the Corbeau River, which uh, is one of the tributaries of the Shazy River. Uh, so I don't know if it's how well known that Ebenezer Cooper is because I've heard people speculate where did Coopersville get its name well it's, it's now you know <laughs> it's in here, yes. um, then we get into Chazy which was formed March 20th 1804 in 1860 there were several hamlets that were there Chazy, West Chazy, Ingraham, Sciota and it mentions the first settler as being John La Trombois not La Trombois yeah, interesting. Yeah, so, uh, and all the other historical references that we see, we see La Frambois, including that marker that we saw when Certainly. we did the story with uh, Clarence Baker uh, down by the lake. Uh, but you wonder, because it's in Trombley's Bay, if there is a connection <laughs> there. So it makes you wonder, you know. But he came there in 1763. So that was even before the town was formed. Uh -huh. <coughs> and again, there's an ad with the, the Pawkett family, Larry Pawkett and Celine, of course, and uh, Larry's father, uh, William Pawkett. So it's just nice history. Even though it's an ad, it's, it's still it's history. It's still historical, so yeah. it's part of the whole thing. Yeah. As we found many times by looking at old uh, oh, yeah. catalogs and old, old books. Pro old programs. And, uh, yeah. Old programs. The, the ads are... <laughs> very often the most interesting part of the old publications that we see. Yeah, that's that's one of the first things that many of us do when we look at an old publication is look at the ads, look see who's, the ads. who's doing business in town back then.
reminisce about the old days in Champlain, or the old days in Plattsburgh, or anywhere, they start talking about the stores and restaurants they can remember on the main streets of these communities. And that's why uh, at this juncture, our little corner is going to be including more of that type of stuff. You know, we, we did several in the last year. You know, Jefford Steele, what a great tour oh, that was. You know, the Evergreen Nursing Home, we did the Lake Forest, we did the Comfort Inn, and we've done several, and we've got several more in the, in the irons right now, and there's probably several we've done that like, don't pop into my mind right now, but I think people want to know this, and if you can do it, it doesn't, we're not doing it to uh, promote business, we're doing it because 20 years from now, 25 years from now, even now it's important for people to know what's going on in those places, but it becomes even more so in the, in the future. Absolutely. Okay, Clinton, uh, which, is, as we said, is Cherubusco, was formed from Ellenburg in uh, 1845. Back then, and even in 1880, 1885, they were spelling Cherubusco as C-H-E -E instead of C-H-U, as we spell it now. There were two other uh, little hamlets, the Frontiers and Wrightsville, at that point. Ellenburg came from, uh, was, a, was named uh, after Ellen, the daughter of John... R. Murray of New York, one of the principal proprietors of, uh, of Ellenburg, which was township number five, and that happened in 1830. And the three hamlets are still there. In fact, there's another hamlet that I'm not mentioned here, the hamlet of Merrill. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, Moores was named after Benjamin Moores, which I think most people are aware of. Uh, the hamlets there were Santraville, or Centerville, which is now Moore's Forks, and Moore's, and also Angelville. <coughs> now, apparently, there must have been a little tradition in, uh, that was known as Angelville. Angelville now is just a little road that's probably two or three miles long, and there's little visible evidence, unless you get out and explored, possibly, that there was ever a community named Angelville there. There are dozens and dozens of so-called ghost towns in Clinton County alone and in most other northern counties. Communities that sprung up along rivers and creeks for the purpose of commerce and mills and so on, which thrive for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, these mill towns and mill communities, and then they're gone, yep. and now they exist in name only, like Angelville. It, People know where the Angelville Road is, <laughs> but don't know why you're it's hard put to find it. <laughs> there's no town hall. Let's put it that way. Oh, there's no, there's no hardly, there's no buildings. There's maybe a house there that uh, might be it. You know, schools and churches are a big part of the history of any area, and you cover we, both of those. We covered the churches. We wanted the churches. We didn't. We we, we wanted the churches to submit their history, and we didn't, you know, ask them to pay for that. So uh, all the churches are are included in here and written by their members, and not written by an outsider so it was it's their history and the first presbyterian church of rouses point uh first met i guess in about november 20th uh, 1890. 1890 yep so it goes into their history there there's two pages on the history of the presbyterian church the history on the north country golf club uh, this was an ad but it also is history and it mentions that andy weston uh, donated 65 acres to the town of champlain for an establishment of the golf course a beautiful and, photograph isn't that neat? Yeah. So that's uh, even though that's an ad that paid for by the golf club, it's, uh, it's still also a piece, it's still a, a great great piece of history. And now we move into the uh, H.K. Averill portion, and I'm gonna ask you to read that uh, top paragraph if you would, Gordy, because I uh, would be delighted because the uh, name uh, Averill is, is synonymous with uh, the history of Plattsburgh and Clinton <laughs> County. H.K. Averill Jr. was a civil engineer, surveyor, draftsman, patent solicitor, and notary public, whose father, Henry Sr., was a 16-year-old who fought on the American side during the Battle of Plattsburgh on September 11, 1814. You've heard us talk about it often. He was one of the teenagers who defended Plattsburgh at uh, Bridge Street Bridge here in Plattsburgh and received an honorary a rifle under uh, an edict from the United States Congress some 20 years later. And uh, thanks to our good friend, City Clerk Keith Herklow and others, six of those rifles have been found so far. And they're worth big money if you find <laughs> one in your attic. 
<coughs> to, con to continue. In 1879, H.K. Averill Jr. published his first edition of the Geography and History of Clinton County, a book we've mentioned here already on the program. Part of his motivation was that the publication would be used as a teaching tool for the education of school children in the county. In his preface to the revised and expanded edition in 1885, he states, and we're quoting again, to be geographer to the people of Northern New York is the height of my ambition. Local historians have long recognized that he indeed achieved his greatest ambition and we're forever in his debt. And so, here are selected portions of Averill's new geography and history of Clinton County, New York, published in 1885. So you begin with a geographical sketch yeah. from the book. Yeah, and he goes back a little bit further than the Gazetteer did because he mentions in 1772, Charlotte, was formed from the county of Albany. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, ex included both sides of uh, Lake Champlain. Uh, Fort Montgomery was, I mean, uh, Montgomery County was formed, and then from there, Clinton County was formed in 1788. He gets, he has a big story on the early roads, including the uh, military turnpike, and how it was constructed, and why it got its name, and this is great history for school children and for people alike who travel down these roads every day and have no idea why we call it the military turnpike or the old military turnpike. And why would we call a road the plank road? <laughs> well, guess what? I've learned in doing some research on one-room schoolhouses across the United States for a presentation to retired teachers that there are lots of plank roads and there are lots of hard scrabble roads and lots of roads that have the same name because they come from the same they were made of planks that's right they were corduroy roads they were plank roads they were gravel hard scrabble roads so yeah it, this is great the, the, the history of the old military turnpike alone is a wonderful that's, history of north country yeah, travel that's just and written in 1885 these people were close to the early history and they could talk to people who were here in the in the early part of the century <laughs> And some of the old roads were toll roads, so you had to pay on your way through. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. that's great. Yeah. And it mentions there that the There's toll, the toll gate. gate yeah. and the, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I haven't looked at this page, but I happen to know that piece of history, that there was a toll gate at the crossing of the Chazy River. And I learned from here that uh, my road, the Ridge Road, was uh, used as early as 1789 because the Ridge Road isn't just a name, there's an actual ridge there and it goes through Shazy by Miner's Farm, Miner College, and then follows. And if you come down my road, you'll see that on both sides, you are lower on both sides. So naturally, it's the ridge. You wanted to, uh, if you're coming with your horses and buggies and whatever else, or even on foot, you want to be high and dry as much as possible. So you would follow the ridge. And that's what they did. That's where the Ridge Road came. That's why the Ridge Road is is in a straight line like the military turnpike because it wasn't really man-made. It was it was man-made and probably they're following deer trails. Well, you know, we've, that's something I was just going to mention. Old Indian <coughs> trails, Native American trails, deer trails, animal paths, natural courses through woods and so on have been used for hundreds and hundreds of years. And when you drive down any of these major North Country highways and roads like the Ridge Road, you can think wow, this could have started, you know, Native Americans could have walked on their way to the river down this road 300 years ago, 400 years ago. So yeah, there's, there's a great history, you know, look at any road and, and somebody has written the history of that road somewhere. And so it's nice to have the roads from H.K. Averill, isn't it? From yep. that perspective all those years ago. Yep. And then, there's, then it goes into a, a section on uh, railroad history. And right in the middle of that history, if you turn the page, <coughs> Jim Rochester dug up a whole bunch of uh, railroad pictures Wonderful. and other uh, old photographs from different sources, various sources. But he includes uh, two pages of, uh, of railroad pictures because Rouse's Point was a major hub. I think there were five or six railroads with headquarters, major, you know, with not major headquarters, but headquartered right there in Rouse's Point because that's where they'd meet. It includes a, a wreck at the Diamond, and, which is near uh, Lake Street where the 
the north-south tracks cross the east-west tracks. Pictures of double headers. We think of those as applying to our favorite <laughs> baseball teams. Double headers, of course, referring to the fact that they sometimes needed two engines to pull, pull long freight loads. Yeah. Uh, this brings us to the point that railroads are such a huge part of any area's history. And here in the North Country, how many times have we talked about railroads in our interviews with Addie Shields, in our interviews with Mr. Shaughnessy, who's mm -hmm. written the world, most famous books in the world about railroads. Yeah, and Shaughnessy. you know, there aren't very many people who don't have a fascination with railroads. You and I remember, especially me, uh, I remember the steam, <coughs> the steam era, which is a huge and fond part of my memories because for much of my life I lived near a railroad and as a small child a wave to the, to the engineers and conductors on the way by and then for you and I to take our cameras and go to the North Country, uh, the, the wonderful Adirondack Museum and Blue tour Mountain some Lake. of these and Blue Mountain Lake and tour the old cars, the, the plush old cars and talk about railroads, that's why it's such a big part of it. Just beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Now one picture showing an engine being pulled out of the lake on the Rutland trestle. Wow! What kind of a crane would it take to pull an <laughs> engine out of the lake? And how did it end up in there? And know? how did it get there in the first place? Uh, there's also a section here on the U.S. Customs Houses and Post Offices. In 1885, there were 45 post offices in Clinton County. And yeah, all, Paisleyville all had Paisleyville had one. I've decried the fact that they closed down uh, some of these small post offices, and when they finally decided to pay, take the post office out of Peasleyville, it broke my heart. Yeah, well, let's see here. There was one in Clinton Mills, which is in in the town of Clinton. Uh, there was one in, I don't know if there's still one in, there probably may, might still be one in Clintonville. I'm not sure if there is. Uh, Coopersville had one. East Beekman Town has one. Beekman Town doesn't have one right now, but East Beekman Town used to have one. Uh, Ferona. Let me talk of just for one second about Ferona, not to digress too much, but we talked about ghost towns. One of the most famous of all Clinton County ghost towns was a place called Ferona, which as you might guess, refers to the fact that they mined iron ore there. And it's right outside of Harkness. And I can take you around the area and show you wonderful remnants of tremendous commerce and mining, which you don't just see driving by on the highway. And that's what I, urge not only urge our viewers to buy a copy of this book but take the information and go walking through the woods to see what you can find off the angelville road and if you want to ask me about ferona i can show you where there's <laughs> the beautiful remnants of a great old stone schoolhouse there but yeah, forest, frontier forest frontier is above uh, cherubusco yeah <coughs> ingraham had one irona lapham moffittsville uh merrill had one at that time peasleyville as you mentioned uh, Point of Rush had a, a post office, Rogers Field, which is now Lion Mountain. Yeah. Uh, Sayota had a post office, Union Falls, Valcor had a post office, Woods Falls had a post office. 45 of them back in 1885. And many of them, many of them did not uh, have their facilities in, in separate post office buildings very often. They were just in private homes where they, like the original telephone operators, yeah, or store, Central was or located store next or door whatever, or yeah. a store. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there's another, there's a, there's a picture page now. As we start to get more into the pictures here, as we get by the April history, we really started getting into pictures. Uh, these pictures were uh, shared from uh, with ben Ar Benny Arnold, who shared some of his old photos. But, oh, uh, just great old ferries and cars, and yeah. just absolutely wonderful. Yeah, here's a softball team that won a title in '81. Beaumont team, they wanted their picture in there, so they they bought a, a spot in the book, and <laughs> there they are. I told Charlie McGee in cleaning up my garage <laughs> a few weeks ago that I found the old Plattsburgh Aces and later. Uh, McGee softball team uniform, which wouldn't fit one of my smaller <laughs> children these days. And there's another, you know, Harrison's ad is full of pictures of the place, and it shows their history and it goes back to uh, 1981. And you know, so it's not just a, an ad; it's a history of that uh, facility, which is one of the few remaining locally owned and operated uh, pharmacies in the county. And I have to give special credit to those responsible for reproducing these photographs. They're beautiful. Uh, That's not an easy job with some of the old pictures. If I think of it, I'll show you some pictures later on. Uh, Elaine 
Rochester, or Elaine uh, Cloutier did a lot of that. She would, some people would bring in horrendous pictures and she would doctor them up, spend hours doctoring them up. And it's really gratis time, I mean, because oh, they certainly. weren't being paid enough to, to spend that kind of time. And well, what a the, difference. the quality of the, of the paper that uh, the Rochesters went with to uh, Border Press to, uh, to put this, it really brings out these photos, these black and white photos really show up because this paper is so white. We've seen uh, <coughs> more ambitious and less ambitious historical publications where they use a lot of photographs, but either before the age of uh, digital repair, shall we say, uh, it was very, very difficult to get the pictures to show up. They're either too dark or too light or fuzzy. And so what you can do today, if you want to take the time, is tremendous, and I, I applaud her for all of that work. Yep. And we have a chapter here, a little paragraph on ancient Indian occupation that Averill wrote. Then we get into Altona in 1885, population of 3,570. Well, actually, it's quoting the 1880 population. 14 school districts. Think about it. Yeah. I've been doing that research on the one-room schoolhouses, and there was one on every every street corner. We've talked about a, a lot of those on our program. Shazy had 17 school districts. It mentioned that the town is named after Sierra de Shazy, which was spelled C-H-U-S-Y, according to Averill, who was an officer that came over from uh, Fort St. Anne at Isle of and was killed with a, a skirmish by the Indians in 1665, and that's where Shazy gets his name from. Nobody's ever been able to find out his first name. All they know is he was an officer, Monsieur de Shazy. C-H-U-S-Y. <laughs> that's how they spelled it. There's a picture of her over here amongst the ads of um, a lady who died uh, two years ago, uh, who was a much-loved person, and uh, somebody from California sent in a picture. Uh, Maxine Greenberg Shemp sent in this picture. that She wanted Mrs. Uh, Francis St. Maxims to be included in this, and I'm glad she did, because we were, I definitely wanted a way to get her picture in his book. That's lovely. Champlain had uh, uh, 13 school districts. Uh, it mentions uh, point, uh, the White House at Point Affair, which was a British stronghold. It mentions uh, a settler named Vinlay, who lived at, uh, in the area of, the, of Fort Montgomery back in 1777, to show the uh, how long white people settled this area. One of the, definitely one of the first settlers in the county. Yep. Uh, town of Clinton. This uh, Cherubusco had a population of 2,194 and had 13 school districts <laughs> in the town of Clinton, in the Cherubusco area. It's hard to believe. You're giving me some, some great information for my <laughs> little presentation to the teachers. And, and in 1885, these are the communities. Cherubusco, which, was, which we find out was formerly called Summit Section, Station. Wow. I never knew that before. Highest land on the Ogdensburg Lake Champlain Railroad. Yeah. Ha! Huh. Clinton Mills, which is a couple miles uh, east of uh, Cherubusco. Frontier, again, that's uh, north of uh, Cherubusco and it's right on the Canadian border. And we go to Ellenburg. There are 18 school districts. And Ellenburg had a population of almost 3,200 people. Yep. Uh, first first uh, permanent settler, settler in uh, Ellenburg was Abner Pomeroy, about 1,800. And it goes on to Moores, had a population of 4,381 and 24 school 24 districts. 24 school districts, wow. <laughs> uh, first settler was uh, Bosworth in 1796. Their villages at that time were Moores, Moores Junction, Moores Forks, and Woods Falls. Thorns Corners, Green Valley, and Canaan are thickly settled neighborhoods. So they weren't called hamlets. They call them villages, but they, you know, they were actually weren't villages. They were hamlets. They weren't incorporated. Uh, then there's a historical sketch of of uh, the area again, and it mentions Samuel D. Champlain was born in 1567, and this I found interesting. In 1611, he married Helen Boulet, a girl of 12 year 12 years of age, and in 1620 he brought his wife over to Canada for the first time. It was so. not that uncommon in that time in France to have a, uh, marriages arranged. We've heard about arranged marriages, and it was not not uncommon for people <laughs> to be married at the age of 12 because, you know, you, uh, you've had large families and many rural families had 8, 10, 12, 
15 children to help mm -hmm. you with the work yep. you had to do? Well, in this case, I think uh, they didn't actually live as husband and wife until by about 1620. So even though we married this young child, I don't think he... You didn't bring her here until 1620. Yeah, so I, I think... Uh, I don't think there was uh, a marriage in the, the respect, the physical marriage that we might expect. You know, I think uh, I've heard elsewhere that he uh, he didn't, you know, <laughs> he didn't misbehave until later. If we can, uh, let's see. I don't want to skip any pages here. There's, uh, and there's a, another section Avril put on in War and Battles. And again, there's just so much. Uh, people will learn so much about battles that were fought in the county. <coughs> Our commemorations of the Battle of Plattsburgh and the Battle of Valcor touch the highlights, and so people are familiar with those. There are so many lesser battles and skirmishes, and some very important battles that were fought that aren't oh, mentioned we're often talking in 1666, 1689, 1704. French and Indian War. Uh, later on, and so many, so many conflicts that were fought. Indian Chief, the Great Mohawk. Huh. This, this is a good piece of information, and if somebody's really excited about history, they can read that whole Averill book if they can get a copy of it, right? Uh, 1813, there you are. Six, this is before the, you know, a year before the Battle of Plattsburgh, 6,000 troops in Champlain and Chazy, and there was a cantonment. We talked so much about Pike's cantonment. Well, in 1813, there was a cantonment between Champlain, it says it was two miles south of the village of Champlain and one mile north of Chazy Village. Well, that doesn't quite work out because there's more than two and a half miles difference in the distance, but it does point out that somewhere there's a cantonment in the champlain Chazy area. It would be nice to do some archeology span there if it's not underneath the school or it's something. It's just a matter of finding where it was. You'd have to assume it was somewhere by a body of water and go from there. A lot of history involved, including that of Thomas McDonough, the Battle of Plattsburgh, and the Treaty of Ghent on the 24th of December in 1814, facts that uh, people interested in history are aware of. Um, okay, we're going to next go to Dr. Beaumont, and I'm going to take this opportunity, because we've been talking for over an hour, to switch our tapes. I'm probably going to freeze a picture of Dr. Beaumont, and next time people see us, we'll be right back here. Okay. Okay, we are we are back, Gordy, and we've got the course we're in the park as we mentioned, and the people are bringing their children to take advantage of this bright sunny day. In the day. Melissa Penfield Park on Bailey Avenue in Plattsburgh, uh, and uh, ordered by Boynton Avenue on the other side. It's great to be here on a beautiful, sunshiny day toward the end of September 2002, and we're talking about Dr. William Beaumont, fascinating person uh, who's well remembered by history, isn't he? Huh? Yes. Uh, in fact, there's a building at the Plattsburgh State named the Beaumont Building, and that's named after this gentleman. And a Beaumont Health Care Center out there on the Bear Swamp Road. Yep. Um, and a plaque downtown. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, he wasn't uh, born in Champlain. He was born, I think, in Connecticut. But he came here and became the first schoolmaster. He uh, uh, later studied to become a doctor, uh, served in the, the military during the War of 1812, Set up practice here in Plattsburgh after the war, then rejoined the military, went out to the uh, Michigan area, and while there, he came across a man named St. Martin. What's got a St. Martin? He had a big hole in his stomach, and it wouldn't heal. So he conducted experiments on this poor fellow. Uh, he would drop uh, meat on a string into his uh, digestive system. And watch it work. Yeah, and and watch so it. did other people. The wound was more than the size of the palm of a man's hand, and the wound was called a permanent open gastric fistula, and it really was. It never completely healed and became the object of uh, a lot of interest then and certainly in well, history. But we learned a lot about the oh, we stomachs and the uh, digestive system because of this, and Dr. Beaumont is a pioneer in that area, and it didn't seem to affect uh, St. Martin he outlived Dr. Beaumont. He died at age 86. 86. That's all that good food they dropped in there. It must be. Isn't that amazing? But yeah. it's, it's... So it's a fascinating little thing. 
And another person that uh, I'd uh, heard of many years ago and I've tried to learn more about is a guy named Yehudi Ashman, who was born in Champlain in uh, 1794. But uh, we have a one-story article written by uh, Woody McClellan in August of 1959. Rather than take Woody's article and rewrite it, I said, I'm going to use Woody's article because this man's responsible for so much of our history. I want uh, one of his articles or more. There's a couple of them in here that, that were written by Woody and they're in there as he wrote them. But uh, Ashman uh, went on to uh, become the George Washington of the nation of Liberia. Uh, uh, There's a movement to uh, free slaves, send them back to Africa, and they formed this nation of Liberia. And uh, he was uh, one of the founding fathers. And when you realize this man died at age 34, you uh, realize what he accomplished in such a short time. Yeah. And next we have another series of photos, including there are several in here that are very interesting, including the Smiley Willette and Sunset Rambler. Oh, and oh boy, WPTZ and, Channel 5. Yeah. But there's one from 1909, and there's an ice storm in 1909. And uh, looked very familiar to what we experienced Boy, in 1998. it looks like it did rival our 98 storm, So huh? uh, maybe that's, it wasn't a lunch and a, a blue moon event. Uh, you know, maybe these uh, do happen every 100 years or so, except that now we're, we're so dependent on the electric wires and so on that uh, back then they had their wood stoves and they had their way of life yeah. and they, they just went on with things. Oh, boy. <coughs> and here's a two-page article that uh, Joseph Gooley gave us the pictures of and he also provided me with uh, a newspaper uh, from 1962 uh, regarding the Atlas missile bases and this is the one that uh, was in Champlain and uh, I was able to quote extensively from that Champlainer and uh, there are 12 sites in the area around the in the first one uh, well, this April 6, 1962 issue mentions the first missile. They won't tell you exactly when it was coming in, but uh, they do, uh, you know, they, they do give a good... Uh, General Dynamics article. Astronautics came to town with <coughs> thousands and thousands of workers and forever changed the, the economic uh, history of Clinton County back in those days. And it's interesting we should mention this now because one of those former missile... Uh, sites one of 12 around the area is for sale on ebay <laughs> it's going off today september 25th 2002 it hasn't i looked this morning it didn't have a bid yet two it didn't have a oh. bid because the bidding started at 2.5 <laughs> million dollars yeah. <laughs> but you could buy it now for 28 million so, yeah. I, so I, nobody so unless there's a late bidder it may not be sold but uh, that was uh, interesting yeah that we're taking that today and that yeah, that should happen today more photos <laughs> here's coopersville, coopersville. Uh, Suzanne Moore, Shan Moore wrote this article on Coopersville for us, and we have different photos, including some train wrecks and a bridge being built. Uh, mentions that, uh, as we mentioned before, that Corbeau was the original name of the community. Uh, French Canadians uh, settled it in the late 1700s. And the first Catholic church it was built there in 1818. Uh, it was one of the first one or two in the Diocese of Augensburg. Was ah, right there, in, right in there. Yep. Oh, that's wonderful. And we get into the families. <coughs> oh, these are terrific. I and, love it. Look at the pictures. And here, with this, uh, this is my wife's family. We traced it back to uh, a man who was born in 1708 in Normandy, France. So there's a lot of history in some of these family pages. This one here goes back to 1708. Oh, isn't that great? Yeah, so there's the Yanktills and the Bruce and Connie Yanktill family. And then on the other side, it's alphabetical, but it's Benny Arnold, who was uh, married to Brenda Yanktill. Uh, they're included in there. Then Benny's brother, Richard Arnold, was on the following page. So it, uh, the Yanktills and Arnolds kind of evolve. Uh. <laughs> then the next is another ad, but it's a North Country Medical Group. And uh, it was conceived in 1960, and it mentions the... Uh, the first board of directors. So I'm going to take the liberty of reading Clifford LaPlante, Larry Paquette, Milo Marnes, uh, Dick Collins, Franklin Forbes, Frank Goodrich Jr., Amos Musso, he got Amos misspelled here, Paul, <laughs> Ames. Uh, Paul Vogan, Jesse Walker, Raymond Walsh, and John T. Zerlo, Sr. So, 
those were the ones that conceived the idea of the medical center and uh, made the present North Country Medical Center in the on the Route 11 in Champlain possible. And then uh, there's a, a story here again. This is a small thing that the uh, veterans we we uh, I don't think we I don't think we charged the veterans. I can't tell you for sure if we did or not. If they'll we did, you, it was a small They'll let amount. you know if you yeah. did. But it, it mentions their charter members back in 1920, and it's a nice little story from the uh, Montgomery Post 912. Yep. And uh, Peg Barkholm, even though Peg has moved to Plattsburgh, we're still allowed her to include her family in here. This is Peg Barkholm's family. Then right next to there is the St. Patrick's Church. It shows the original church, which was built in 1859, I think that says. Yes. Uh, and the new church, the present church, was built in 1925. So there's the history of St. Patrick's. Yep. And here's one of the early families that, uh, that came forward and said, hey, we want to be in that book. It's the Norman and Kitty Bashard family. And uh, they've got all their offspring in here with their various families. So before we went to print, I did check. I said, do you have any more? Should we update any of these pictures? Because see, maybe you've had some extra kids. She said, no, it's been a peaceful, <laughs> peaceful couple of years. I love it. Now here's the Louis Bedard family. That This is the guy who lives, Louis and Rita, Rita live at the Dewey Tavern. And he's got an old milk cart that his father used what to deliver. What a wonderful photograph. Jean-Baptiste. Yeah. And a... Yep. Oliven, yep. Oliven Bedard. Yeah. Oh my. Lovely old, uh, great old photos and just. Just terrific. Yeah. Just uh, a lot of a uh, lot of this. Here's the Billiter family that uh, operate the uh, WCHP radio, Christian radio station. They didn't come to town until 1988, but they've certainly uh, been a nice part of the community. And uh, there's the there's their family history. And Brandy used to work with me for a short time at the radio station. There's the Carey family who've been around for a long time. And this little girl here uh, died in 1963, drowned on a family outing. Oh, boy. And uh, I'm sure I'd seen her in church and so on, but to just say what she looked like, I had no idea. I mean, I was just I was a senior in high school that year, and I was going to become a senior in high school. So I just thought it was great that they included that picture of that beautiful little girl in this Isn't film. Isn't that just terrific? Yep. And then there's more. This uh, Pat Carey has her, her family, her family and uh, her her grandchildren and then her business is on the next page the uh that small world daycare center she just included a whole bunch of the kids <laughs> that's, uh, that's great <coughs> and then here's uh, another one of the articles that i wrote oh so, yeah rambling narrative and that's what it is Plains history and here i point out uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek but that it could ar be argued that the town of champlain and actually in clinton county are actually older than the state of new york yes because March 7, 1788, the colony of New York established the town and the, and the county. The state, the union uh, contract, the uh, ratification of the Declaration of Independence and so on, uh, the Constitution, didn't take place until July 26, 1788. So that's when New York uh, was the ninth state to ratify the Constitution, uh, two and a half months after, or three and a half months after the... That's a nice little tidbit, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And you mentioned uh, Indians running around here uh, 400 years ago. Russ Bellico, in his Chronicles of Lake Champlain, quotes another source of saying that 9300 BC, the speculation that the first uh, natives were roaming these parts in the Champlain Valley. So you wonder why they find ancient things in the lake and when yeah. they do archaeology around here. Yeah, and of course, up until 1763, all of our area around here was part of New France. Uh, and there's mentions one of the battles here that was fought. The Rogers Rangers fought at Point Affair. It's mentioned in what I've tried to do here is I've written, mentioned the sources of what I was able to find. So people can go to Chronicles of Lake Champlain by Russ Bellico. They can go to Peter Palmer's History of Lake Champlain, 1609 to 1814. They can go to uh, Herd's, history. Hamilton, uh, Herd's History of History of Clinton and Essex and Franklin Counties. Uh, they can go to Alan Everest's Point Affair on Lake Champlain book and find this stuff. Yeah, if they want to pursue right. it. Right, so I've tried to be true to that to let people know where to find out more if they're interested, what books to look for. Uh, these sketches uh, may look uh, rudimentary, it's because I did them. But oh. this shows. <laughs> okay. <coughs> but it shows uh, how New York pictured the area 
in the uh, late 1700s and how Vermont pictured it in 1781. They were both claiming this side of the lake. <laughs> but Vermont was the Republic of Vermont and was not one of the uh, first uh, 13 colonies because New Hampshire was claiming part of it, New York was claiming part of it, and people like Ethan Allen and so on were claiming their own independence. So that's uh, covered a lot in the history of Clinton and Essex, and, excuse me, Clinton and Franklin counties, uh, Herd's history. And also there's a little sketch here of the areas, the towns that were possibly included in the first town of Champlain, which included Albert, Vermont, Isle Mont, and all the way over as far as... Uh, uh, Belmont, well, beyond Belmont, over to Bangor, Constable. Fort uh, Covington, Fort Westville, Covington, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, in, in Franklin County. That was all considered part of the town of Champlain in 1788. Uh, there's also a little thing in here from Pliny Moore's uh, journal on the year of 1816, a year without a summer, and it gives his, uh, his uh, entries into his uh, diary, talking about the cold weather that year. Severe frost in June. And I found out this summer when I picked up that book that uh, Ted Mills put together in Malone. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, piecing all these little things together. I found out after and I included in an addendum at the end of the book that in 1815 there was a tremendous uh, eruption of a volcano. And that just kind of blackened the whole skies in North America. And this year without a summer was not just a North American over in England and so on. Even Europe suffered that year of 1816 where there was virtually no summer. It's amazing. You know, he talks about frost in the middle of July here to give yeah. you an idea. And then it just gets worse as it gets into yeah, the fall this, of the next year. This, wasn't, this was written the day that the frost occurred. He put it in his journal and that's where it came from. So it's not uh, somebody re recalling here. This is actual written in his journal. And on September 27th, which is right around what uh, this time would be as we're recording this, he says, uh, good day, severe frost and ice. A couple of days before that, ice froze ice a quarter inch. Yeah. <laughs> Here we are talking with a beautiful day in the 60s to almost 70 degrees. But they had snow in June and, and just amazing that year. Well, well, these people look a little familiar. Yeah, this, we got into the, uh, this is the Castine page. And here we've chased ours to uh, Jean-Baptiste Castine and beyond, because it mentions his parents when he got married to Genevieve Cote on October 14, 1776 in, in Bay St. Paul. So again, we're in this family history, we're going back beyond 1776. And to let people know that names change, for one reason or another, the spellings change from C-A-S-T-A-I-N-G to C-A-S-T-A-G-N-E and on to the present C-A-S-T-I-N-E. Yeah, I was very fortunate, uh, thanks to my Aunt Marguerite, who uh, alerted me to the, to the picture and I was able to get the picture from uh, Marjorie Duquette because it's her grandfather. But uh, this is uh, the Frank Castine, the first one who moved into the town and the first one to be spelled C-A-S-T-I-N-E as it is now. When he came here, that's when they started spelling it that way. The people heard his name, and that's how they wrote it. So he came here, and he's found an 1869 map. So I've been able to uh, get photos of uh, everyone from that era down, right? From Isn't that so wonderful? his son Ed, and my my father's father Bert, and my father and his generation. I got my grandfather and my uh, mother, my father's side, and his mother's side. At the Morris Forks Railroad Ed, Station. Edmund Trombley. And then it just carries on into the next two pages. We've got uh, the current generation, and then uh, the next generation is, uh, is our kids that start having kids. Oh, isn't that wonderful? And isn't that, that wonderful? Then we go to the Trudeaus, which is my... We, we try to be alphabetical as much as possible here, but when there's a... Connection. When there's a connection there, we, we tie them in together. So the Trudeaus is my mother's family. We trace it back to Etienne Trudeau, Trudeau with a T. Uh... He was born in 1641, and he came to New France in 1659, and there's a plaque uh, uh, commemorating his uh, battle with uh, 
Balor against the Iroquois in, in uh, 1662. It's in downtown Montreal at uh, St. Andre and some other street that I can't pronounce. Yeah. So there's a plaque up for him there. Then in, they get into my mother's, my mother was, one, there was the youngest living child. Uh, she had one more that died, uh, was born after her, but died very young. Uh, but there are 19 children from Henry and Rosina Trudeau. <laughs> and he's got pictures of all 19. And one of my cousins had carried it on and uh, made a list of all of my cousins. So all the descendants of, uh, of those 19 children are, are included in this, oh my. this family Isn't history. Oh, that wonderful? Yeah. And now we're completing the uh, end of the uh, rambling history. And just one of the names that's mentioned from a Reverend Taylor was Joseph King, for whom King's Bay is mentioned. It's just, you know, little pieces of history, just maybe a line or two in here that somebody might find interesting. And there's a story on uh, his education in Champlain written by McClellan. And we're only up to page 85, so we gotta, <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna get this in two hours, we gotta get going. Here's the Dubois family, part of the Ashline family, and then it evolves into the Levanture family here, so. Uh, different uh, different families, the Duffy and the Frankie family from Rouse's Point, another large family. They got a pile of kids, and uh, the, the, one of the descent, one of the Duffy girls, his name is Frankie now, and that includes her, her family history. There's an article from the Champlain Milk Producers. How uh, can you not include them, right? Well, uh, that's only one. There probably should have been at least half a dozen oh, different, sure. but that's the only one that submitted a history, so we've got their history in there. But uh, definitely dairy was a, a big factor in the history of the of Champlain. The Daughters of Charity of Sacred Heart, who taught for so many years at St. Mary's, sent us uh, two pages of information, including a picture of the old convent, which is torn down in the middle 60s. Oh. <laughs> John Zerlo submitted this oh, page. Of course he would. On the Northway North Drive. North Drive-In. So some great history there on the, on the drive-in. Uh, so that, that's that's... Wonderful articles like that that just help oh, sure. bring this pay, this book out. Here's the Gamash family, and I'm I was sorry here that uh, Clifton Gamash didn't include his his father's picture in here because his father was one of the first graduates, first graduating class from St. Mary's Academy. Oh, no kidding! Yeah. And Ralph Gilpin's uh, family is in here. Ralph's got a whole pile of of children, mainly girls, and he ran a Montgomery Ward's catalog house for part of his life. He's been uh, town clerk for many, many years. And the Glode family submitted their their family pictures. There's an ad from Garso's Auto, but it goes back and tells the history of the station, uh, how it started in 1981 and evolved and so on. So it, uh, these are just nice little things to have in here. And it's an ad, but it's got history to it, too. Absolutely. And the Gokey family, I know the Gokey family is one of the ones that came to the open house at Champlain Telephone last year and said, hey, we got to get in that book. And, and there they are. There's the hometown cable ad. <coughs> I didn't get a free ad. I had to buy this. Oh, oh you did? You didn't send me a bill because you got my <laughs> picture in there. <laughs> uh, but there's this drawing that Sid Couchy did uh, of me, and there's oh, Bob Van, and there's there you are, and uh, here's a couple pictures I uh, take took out of the Shazy uh, one of the Shazy yearbooks of Sam at work, and uh, the reason he was in there was because this. It's almost unheard of, uh, but they dedicated a yearbook to uh, to Sam several years no back. No kidding! And I've never, wow. I've never heard of too many yearbooks being dedicated to somebody who wasn't an actual part of yep. the school family. So that Wonderful. was quite an honor, and uh, you know, so I took a couple of pictures uh, of, of Sam out of there. There's uh, uh, Bill Chase and I, and there's a picture of me shooting uh, Mark McGuire. <laughs> <There's> a, <laughs> yeah, be careful how you say that. There's uh, the Joseph Gooley family. He's the one who sent me the uh, sent us well through Norm Bono. He gave us the pictures of the Atlas missile. And there's uh, the Gooley family, Robin and Stacy Gooley, that uh, oh, they got them all in board, there. Own Board View Grocery, and they've yep. got a nice two-page spread. Old Time Cafe again has some nice old pictures in here. Nice pictures. Uh, there's a, a a spot, a, a shot of what that store looked like, uh, a restaurant looked like, probably uh, 80 years ago. Oh my! You know, an old store in there, and the Grigware family. Another large, large photo, and a lot of these people were in the shade here, and 
they spent a lot of time getting, making these people visible. So they were visible, yes. Yeah. And you and, can. And see every them. one of these people happens to be my cousin, because. <laughs> Do they really? Oh, I uh, love it. My mother is related to the Grigwares. Oh my. Then there's Susan Grigwares family, then the Hunter family, and. Uh, and we go on to a story on the census of 1790. This is going to be kind of dry reading these two pages, but it's, I thought it was important information because it includes Isla Mott and Alberg, which in 1790 were considered part of oh, sure. Champlain. And uh, they are, the funny part is Vermont was also conducting a census. <coughs> and we're not going to spend any time on it, but I included in a section on, on Alberg the different spellings. The Vermont census taker would hear one thing, you'd say the yeah. name, and the New York census taker. So the, the names, the spellings were so something we've talked about. I would about say about 75% of them were different. <laughs> that's great. And here's uh, the LaBelle family. Oh, aren't they great? And here's a Champlain Telephone Company ad. It includes a picture of the ice storm, includes uh, some old uh, some old people from the uh, old. Uh, uh, operators and includes Gordy Little doing an interview. Oh yeah, then we have fun that day, huh? <laughs> had a great tour. And here's the Bill LaBelle family that submitted several pages and included just a historical photo of high water in Champlain that they wanted to include in their family page. 1911. <coughs> so there's several pages of the LaBelle family here. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so that's just, this is wonderful that they got behind this project so much. Well, I guess they did. And here's a bunch wow. of photos I got from uh, Feinberg Special Collections of different scenes oh, in and around wonderful. Champlain. Here's one of the Lauren families. This is Francis and Rita Lauren and their, their offspring. Uh, there's an ad from Modern Mechanical Fabs and another Lauren family, Marcel and Beulah. And he's got all the Lauren brothers, or, or as many people say, Laurent. Yep. But here's a photo right here in this Kiwanis ad. You can't tell here, but the contrast between the people in the shade and the people in the light was, you would not have guessed that anybody could print this, but through a tremendous amount of effort from Elaine Cloutier, she was able to get this here, so it became a, a very legible photo. Yeah. Tremendous yes. amount of work on, on the computer. Wonderful. Wonderful. Here's the Lavalle family. It's got pictures here from a, somebody from, who was born in 1849 and his wife was born in 1848. Oh, you know, just great. priceless photos. Great. Here's an article written by, uh, uh, compiled by John Zerlo, our county clerk. But he didn't want his name attached to it, so don't tell anybody that John... Uh, I can't see his name, John T. Zerlo. <laughs> that's his father. His that, that's his father. He's yeah. John H. Zerlo. But it traces the history back to 1854, then when the Sheridan Company bought it from... Uh, the uh, Clark family, and you've, you've had the pleasure of meeting Lucky Clark. Oh, and, yes. And his son, Rob. So it's got uh, four pages here on the history of Sheridan. Oh, those are great. And including now, that's some, some old machinery. And we had two of the old timers clubs meetings here, one from 64 and one from 86. Now John was just gonna include those and I wouldn't let him off the hook. He says, I can't name them all. I said, try. So he found the people. So he named everybody in his eight, 1964 photo and everybody in his 1986 he named photo. Them all? He, found the sources so he could get everybody, every one of those oh names. Oh my in. goodness, that's amazing. <coughs> here's the uh, ad from the Legion, and here's the Montpelier family. Uh, Jay Montpelier is the uh, president of the uh, Bob Ben Park Committee. <laughs> so his, his family ran a series of cabins, and they, <laughs> he, he wanted a picture of every cabin in there, I he guess. He got them too, <laughs> so didn't he? Huh? Yeah, and here's uh, the Moore family. Uh, which is the family of Suzanne Moore, Shan Moore, but you know, Brian, her husband's family. So there's nice photos of them, because Shan actually comes from uh, Shay Z. The Namiro family. The Namiro ancestry goes back as far as 1615, but they start here with the 1811. And uh, there's one of these guys you might recognize in the Miro family. Oh my goodness. Hal, who gave us such a tremendous tour of the, <laughs> Chaplain, of the CVPH hospital. You know. Everybody was blown away by that tour, and now is the more I look at it, the more I realize how brilliant this young man was, having worked there for so many years, and just took uh, 
an old book and the pictures in one of the old books and gave us a tour into secret places yep. at the old physician's hospital. Yep. So the that Miro, was great. So Miro, and, the, and then the Nautel family, which is part of the Miro family, oh, is included. Sure. And Alice Mossy's got her, her family in here. And then the Natupski and the Goddard family includes a photo of the old Ben Franklin store that the <laughs> Pete and Sally ran. Here's a, here's a portion of the book, and probably about eight, nine pages here, that Jim Rochester said, if I was putting this together, it probably wouldn't uh, be part of the book. But I, I wanted to include it because I wanted to get names and pictures in here. This is the official voting list from the year 2000, I think March of 2002. And when we got it on a disc, in order to handle it, we had to, it comes in sections and you can't, you couldn't alphabetize it. Well, you could have alphabetized it, but then it would have been a lot of work to, to get all the addresses in there because uh, A, Castine and B, Castine and then C, Castine might have three different addresses. And sure. So I decided to go with the addresses. And the only way we could do the addresses was you do all the ones first, then all the twos. So 1999, so on, it comes ahead of number two someplace else. Oh, wow. But uh, I know uh, years from now, there are people who say, I wonder who lived at my address oh, sure back they then. they do so, that so, all the time. So they can find they us. Do. So uh, Peter Stone uh, did the bulk of the early work to get it so we could handle it. He's a computer whiz, and he got it so we could handle it. In a, and then Mary Rasco stepped in and did all the all the work to get it so that we, it became uh, something that we could print in a book, get it down to a size we could do it, and eliminate see, the duplicate names. that will take great meaning, meaning 25, 50, 100 years from now. Yeah, yeah. Then Wyeth Harris became, you know, became a big part of the book. They bought the, they bought, this is their ad, just a picture of the facility. Yep. Just a, a Wyeth. But then it goes into their history, traced back to 1925. When uh, Harris McKenna and Harrison was formed in Montreal, then in March 1934, when they opened up in Rouse's Point, We've got some old history there. And when I was looking for the uh, history of that the Reverend Taylor had written, I had seen this article before, but I couldn't have told you anything about where it was in the North Countryman. But I came across it, so we've got the actual article from the North Countryman when Harris came into town. And oh, that's probably neat. had a high end full of people. Three, four people were working there, and that was it. And now it's up to, I think, 1,700, 1,800 people between Champlain, between Chazy and Ross's Point. <coughs> then we have the um, the Clark Funeral Home ad, which is the story of the Pliny Moore house. Pliny Moore, the first settler of Champlain. There's the story of his house, and the Parsons family has included their history along with the with that. Here's a story on uh, Perry's Mills. Uh, originally, it was simply a mill station known as Shefflin's Mills, and the mill privileges came into the possession of George Perry and Silas Hubble. In 1819, Mr. Perry purchased Mr. Hubble's interest. A post office was established there in 1831. <laughs> so it's the history of uh, the Kaufman involvement in it, because the Kaufmans ran that mills for most of the 20th century, and uh, it's a great history. There's a history of the uh, Knights of Columbus House and in uh, Champlain, which was, according to uh, McClellan, was probably about 20 different uses over the years, including the Customs House and, and the movie theater. theater yeah. and, uh, then they had some information from Jack Bilo, two pages of information from our good friend Jack Bilo, who was such a historian, including uh, names of families that uh, participated from Canada that participated in the War of 1776. So I've written all the ones that have familiar sounding names. I took them all out of that. I think there was 180 pages I went through. It came out with You've this list of names. You've got to be kidding. One more example of how hard you work to make this book a reality. Just incredible. And here's the Pottery family. This is the Clarence and Sharon Pottery family. And then over here we have the Joseph Pottery family. And uh, I noticed after that they both include uh, Louis uh, and Emma Pottery, yeah. who were... Uh, well, the descendant for both of them, the preceding, you know, preceding the grand, the yeah, ancestors of both. That's great. And the plant family and the Laterno family. This is another little out of order alphabetical here, but uh, there's the plant family. Then uh, Dick Laterno married uh, 
uh, plant. And I'd never, you know, Dick Letourneau was a great, great friend of mine for uh, forever. And he died a little over a year and a half ago, about a year and a half ago. But I'd never seen a picture of his father. And there's a picture of, uh, of Dick's father because he died at a very young age. Isn't that great to have? Yeah. yeah. Uh, here's a story on Hoyle Town, or Hoylton, uh, which is something I became aware of back a few years ago when uh, Bob and I were doing a story with Peg Barcom. So I was able to find uh, through uh, through the uh, Polaris system at the at the Feinberg, Feinberg library. Yep. on the computer. I was able to find information to where to go look for Hoylton, and I found. Uh, enough to write this one-page article on Hoylton, which was Lower Rouse's Point. Isn't that amazing? I didn't know that till this moment. Yeah. And here's some more pictures that we got from there. Uh, these are mainly the Miro family that provided these pictures. <coughs> uh, here's an article that uh, Jim Rochester put together on area printing industry with some nice old photos. Here's some uh, photos, some uh, posters that were printed by McClellan. And uh, these were from the Bob Venn collection. And this is something that I'll never forgive Wayne Miller's predecessors for at Feinberg Library because this was part of the McClellan collection that went there. And there was, I would guess, in the vicinity of 15,000 of these posters that McClellan had printed. Wow. He kept a sample of every one, had them numbered in pencil on the bottom so you could tell in which order they were printed. Yes. And they didn't want to store them anymore, so they gave them to a one of the local churches who was having a flea market type of thing, a book sale. And instead of sending them back to Champlain where they belonged, so Bob Van happened to put on, pawn some. You know, Richard Ward, we saw some in the Moore's uh, story that Richard Ward had given to Carol Netto there that he'd, he'd save some. But they're scattered around all over the country instead of being back in Champlain where they belonged. What a tragedy. Yeah. Uh, here's the Rassico family. Mary is uh, one of the people on the committee. And, uh, traces their their family. Here's a, a two-page story on Rufus King. Uh, he was a local mystery writer that uh, was world famous in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Movies were made from his books. He lived right there at the Thurber uh, Inn in Rouse's Point. He's buried in Rouse's Point. Uh, but he's got, uh, I think, over 20 books that he's written. Uh, mystery novels, uh, Broadway plays were made from his books, movies were made from his books. Uh, just uh, an extremely well known guy. Yeah. 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 Uh, here's the Racine family. This is uh, Celine Racine's uh, ancestors. Her father's up here in the middle. Uh, it shows all of her aunts and uncles and her grandparents. So another large family from Champlain. And the Robert family has several pages in here. They've got a large family, and they've included all their their photos. There's this two, uh, one page article on Fort Montgomery, uh, and some nice photos that uh, we're able to dig up, including one from the uh, Feinberg Library. So it shows tells the history of Fort Montgomery, which was really never used in battle, but it does mention uh, Fort Lennox, which. Uh, came about because of Fort Montgomery. Fort Lennox was built, and if people want to see what Fort Montgomery may have looked like quality-wise, just go up to Fort Lennox. Or, or watch the yeah. video that we did now, there that day. This is a, the story of the last invasion. This is a book I bought on eBay from a former Champlain guy named Mike Kaye. I just happened to, it's called, uh, I think it's just called Lake Champlain and Lake uh, George, I think is the title of it. But in there, there's a small story about this uh, Captain Drolette who was stationed in La Colle in 1865. On 1864, many people might be aware of the raid on St. Albans where a group of rebel soldiers went into Canada, came out of Canada and attacked St. Albans and robbed the banks. And they captured them all. But there was a lot of tension back and forth between Canada and the United States at this time. And in 1865, it was right after Lincoln died, this Drolette decided that he was going to attack Fort Montgomery, which wasn't completed at the time. He was going to attack Fort Montgomery. So he got one of his uh, aides, and he and the aide were coming down in a buggy to, to survey the situation, and he heard gunfire towards Champlain. So he wondered 
It may be the Union soldiers had heard about his impending attack. So he followed the gunfire instead of heading for Rouse's Point in the fort. He headed for Champ the village of Champlain and ended up right in the middle of a big parade commemorating the funeral of Abraham Lincoln. So here he is in the middle of this parade. So he follows it to the church, wanders into the church, and the man giving the eulogy at the top notices this officer <laughs> and commends him for being there to pay honor to Lincoln. So the soldiers that were garrisoned, there was a, I can't say garrison because there never really was garrison, but there were a few soldiers that were maintaining Fort Montgomery, were so impressed that they invited him over for an evening meal. And apparently the main course of the evening meal was bourbon. Drunker than skunks. So they were toasting and he, ended up, he almost had a duel <laughs> with one of the people. But he ended up going back and never yeah, following the, through. The so attack it, never took place. No, so that was really the last invasion. The one guy in a and his aide in a, in a horse and buggy. Oh, my, my, my. <laughs> it's a fascinating little story. And here's the story of the year. Rochester family. Here's a picture taken. This is in 1905 at Point Affair. Isn't that beautiful? And in fact, that is mentions here that John Zerlo's camp is now in that location. No kidding. Yeah, and there's this picture of Jim Rochester who uh, did so much to make this book possible. Uh, again, the Border Press. Here's some uh, more old photos that... Uh, most of these photos, uh, I'd say at least half of them were dug up by Jim Rochester from various sources. Either people brought him into them or he had. And this one here included, I said, you told me about this article, so I said, we have to include that. This is a, two photos taken for a several page article written in 1953 in True Magazine. You remember True oh, Man's Magazine? Very well. Man's I magazine. subscribed to it for years. So. Uh, the photos were taken by a man named Ozzy Sweet, who I've been trying to <laughs> interview for four years now. One of these days, we'll get him. And uh, so I called Ozzy, who was 83 years old, he was living in Maine, he's supposed to be coming up here within a month. And I said, can we, mind if we use those pictures in the book? He said, no, nah, no, I'll go ahead and use them. So there's pictures that were in True Magazine that we included in the book of the Rochester family Isn't hunting in the, in the point of rush. There's this little page on the St. John's family and the Seguin family. Uh, two pages on prohibition and bootlegging. How could you not include that? Yeah, we had to include That's prohibition and bootlegging. Big part of the history, huh? Yeah. Another portion of the Seguin family, Carl Smith's family, Carl and Sally Smith's family, Carl and Sally, both such big parts of the community. I'm glad they got in here. There's this little article from the St. Mary's uh, School and Church. St. Mary's Parish was established in 1870. Uh, they Daughters of the Charity of Sacred Heart came to Champlain in 1906. My son Caleb was looking through this book the other night. This 1962 picture that I found in one of the old yearbooks. He said, so that's what the place looked like. He went there for seven years as an elementary student, but he never saw this picture from 1962 of what the place looked like back when it was a high school. Yep. Our Ross's Point Fire Department submitted a couple pages of uh, history and pictures of, uh, of the fire station. Uh, the fire at the Saxony in 84, how well yeah. we remember that. Jules Trahan, who was one of our committee members, he, he traces his family here back to a man born in 1820. And has photos of his grandfather, his father, and his kids, and then the auxiliary of Rouse's Point included a page. Leander and Ruth Trombley, this is uh, another large family. And Leander was one of the old bootleggers that's mentioned in the articles. <laughs> uh, here's a story from Three Steeples Church. Uh, it mentions from 1799 when Reverend Joseph Mitchell held a quarterly conference at Shifflin's Mills, later known as Perry's Mills. It traces their history of the Methodist Church back to the, uh, to the 1700s. Another group of pictures that uh, the different people have submitted. Uh, again, most of these gathered by uh, Jim Rochester, although the one down in the bottom corner is from a postcard. And I got this, the village of Champlain has a nice collection of old photos. And if people are looking for a village of Champlain pictures, I'd suggest they go there. I saw this postcard on eBay within the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's an old, it says Margaret and Grace's uh, store, and when I was a kid it was Margaret's Variety. The postcard, last bid, I didn't follow it all the way through the end. The last bid was thirty-one ninety-nine. Come on. 
and all the guy had to do was, was the Champlain are bidding on uh, two Champlainers are bidding on it. All I had to do was walk down to the village office if you wanted a picture of that <laughs> and borrow the picture and make a copy. So he's being so there'll be a lot of pictures in here that people uh, <laughs> may find interesting. There's a couple page article on uh, Champlain Fire Department including some old fire apparatus. That's great. On the history. Uh, Christ and St. John's Episcopal Church. They trace it back to 1852 uh, when the first Episcopal service was held in town. Uh, these are pictures from the Joseph Mott collection. And as we're taping this, Joe Mott has a, he's selling all of his old photos on eBay right now. No kidding. Yeah, so on some of his old bottles. So and that derby hat is sold, uh, just been sold. So he's selling a, and this is, for people in Rouse's Point, this picture up here, that was what is at the end of Sportsman's Pier, which is just a wide open pier now. But at one time there was this huge uh, hotel, steamboat hotel there. And people today don't realize that. Wow. Yeah. Uh, here's the Monette family. This is uh, it goes into the Van family because uh, Teresa's mother was a Monette. And uh, so it traces the Monette family and into the Van, Bob Van's family, Bob and Teresa. There's a story on a time capsule with Mary Rascal. So we got to include that because we buried this time capsule in 1977. And in 2077, people won't even remember it. No. So if it's in the book, yeah, people I might mean, remember it. Maybe they'll go back and dig it up, huh? Yeah. And there's a story submitted on the Lakeside Camp in the Amcan Motel and the story of the Ingalls family that ran it and the, the Wright family, Rodney Wright. That's, uh, and various pictures of the various things. You know, there's no theme to this. these pictures here. We've got a picture of the ice storm of 98. We've got a drawing of that uh, steamboat hotel. We've got the Meridian Hotel. We've got the railroad tracks crossing the... Uh, Lake Champlain, we've got uh, Sunny Hill Dairy Delivery Truck, we've got uh, the dedication of the, the Veterans, Korean Veterans Bridge, we've got the Rouse Reunion, we've got a picture from my father's schoolhouse which is located about uh, 150 feet, 200 feet from my house, my father went to school and the people that were in his class, just a variety of photos. And this family is used to being at the end of things, the Zerlo family. <laughs> you got a Z. From A to Z, huh? Yeah. And this picture of Mrs. Zerlo, there was, John Zerlo was standing right on the side here as a youngster. And Elaine Rochester was able, or Elaine Cloutier was able to Crap electronically it. get him out of there. And, make, and you, if you didn't know it, you would not know that there never, was somebody there. Never noticed that. Yeah. So just a That's tremendous amazing. amount of work that went into this. And there's John and Eugene's families. Oh, family. And here's some of the families that submitted just photos that are included in this book. There's a, so as you see, most of the people that did submit photos went for the option of the family page. But these are people that yep. just submitted photos. You get two and a half pages of them. <coughs> and we got a relatively new church in town, a Living Water Baptist Chapel. And there's another page with some different photos. Uh, a story on Tom Cheek, the uh, Toronto Blue Jays announcer, and yeah. some old, uh, old time pictures. There's a story on Dewey's Tavern. Oh, I'm glad you did that. Yeah, uh, Dewey's Tavern, which is called the most historic building in Clinton County by Alan Everest, and it gives a history of what happened there from two or three different perspectives. It's very often forgotten in the story yeah. when it's told here in Plattsburgh. Yeah. Uh, here's something that Addie Shields gave me um, this summer. These are actual letters written by Dr. Beaumont back to his family, in, I believe in Connecticut, in 1807, 1808. <coughs> he was, he was, I think he was born in New Hampshire, or but somewhere there, I think in Lacombe uh, or it, somewhere. Yeah, it mentions where he was born, but... Uh, but here, Great. the rumors it's a, of war very alarming to the norm, northern people as it appears inevitable. This was from August 23rd, wow. 1807, five yeah, years before sure. the War of, of 1812. And here's one from 1808 that I found very enlightening, March 8th, 1808. Many people apprehend the nigh approach of an immediate war with England. Some are shuddering with horror upon the apprehension that Bonaparte will find his way to America at some future periods. Others are exclaiming against the proceedings of Congress, charging the president with partiality toward French, crying out French influence on our cabinets and a concerted plan 
between Jefferson and Bonnet to do war with the British, that Jefferson may be made king in America, and that Bonaparte will be emperor of the world. So when we, when we got involved in that War of 1812, there was a lot of speculation that we were teaming oh, up with Napoleon. And, uh, you know, we were talking, uh, Jefferson was about our third president. Yeah. So this nation was in its infancy, and people were still wondering how things were going to turn uh, out. How it was going to play out. Yeah. Huh? So it's, it's just fascinating to see what was on their minds back in uh, 1808. Just, yeah, just a couple more ar short articles on different subjects. Uh, more photos, a couple more pictures, photos, including Great the... Great pictures. Here's one that uh, Paul Cloutier took. Shows the old bridge and the new bridge under construction. And uh, Ann Willard had his picture just before the final portion of the bridge went in. A couple of uh, railroad stations that I find interesting. The uh, Rutland Railroad Station is about to be torn down or moved. And the... Uh, DNH station is going to be made, made into a museum. So, Isn't two tales of different uh, as a, pictures from the Kaufman's the store and, and Paris Mills, fires in Champlain, which have destroyed uh, between floods and fires. Uh, Champlain downtown has been destroyed over the years. Uh, there's some vital statistics that I got from various sources. 1860, the uh, town population was 58 59 2000 population was 57 91 <laughs> isn't that incredible yeah see the town went down uh, after the closing of Sheridan uh, Harris graphics in 1980 it was uh, 58 89 but we're now uh, about 100 less than what it was uh, 20 years ago but it's less than it was in 1860 it's amazing how stable the populations have stayed over the years yeah. for many of the places in Clinton County yeah. you yeah, got some maps the current maps up-to-date maps that's great uh, a small index of some of the major articles a follow-up to that uh, year Here without 18, the summer that we talked about and the book ends with uh, the 1869 map which I've always found fascinating and then but in which I was able to find the uh, the first cast iron that came in here and and ends with uh, Champlain uh, discovering uh, the lake. Her centenary. Huh? Yep. And I think we just about filled up two hours, Gordy. I think we did. I I, I apologize to those people who uh, are in this book whose families we didn't have a chance to spend a lot of time on simply because of the constraints of the length of our tape. But I hope we whetted people's appetites. I've used that phrase many times on this program so that they will purchase this book. The book will be available for sale. And not only will you have a treasure, but you will have helped a wonderful cause. Because if we can perpetuate the memory of uh, Bob Venn in that park and make it a tribute to Bob for future generations to enjoy long after you and I are gone, we'll have accomplished something. I can't imagine. This is like a college course for you, isn't it? You should get a degree for this. It, uh, it was uh, interesting to do. It took a lot of time away from hometown cable. Uh, uh, but it's something I you know, felt had to be done, and I didn't want to do a half a job. But I don't feel it's an end-all book. I think there's more history to be written, and uh, it wasn't meant to be an in-depth history of, of anything, just sketches of different parts of the the vast history that the area has. These are the hors d'oeuvres, huh? I think so. I think. That, <laughs> I don't think if anybody's looking to put out a, a definitive history of Champlain, this shouldn't uh, shy them away from that. But it's actually the first book of this type that is, you know, just about every community has a, this type of a book. Champlain didn't. And um, again, there's a lot more that could have been written without uh, making it a 500-page book. But... Uh, <laughs> I think uh, there will be future people that will put out another book in future years that uh, may include other more in-depth studies on this. Well, history. I hope the first thousand sell real fast and that you're into the second and third printings <laughs> before we get back to talk about it, Kelvin. I want to personally thank you for all of your hard work in preserving the history of that area and for allowing me to spend a little time with you from time to time to capture the history of other areas of the North Country. I thoroughly enjoy it and I hope you do too. Well, I know, know you know do. I, do. <laughs> I know you do. 
And uh, our suggestions from our audience is always appreciated. Anytime they can call one of us, email us, or give us a telephone call and let us know about possible subject matter. We're always looking for great subjects to include in this program. And who knows where we're going to be next time for our little corner. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>